Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining. Um, I think we've got a very interesting webinar for you today. Uh, great topic. And I think just before we dive into everything, we've got a little bit of the usual sort of housekeeping to do. Um, if we've got any questions at all, in the, um, feel free to just ask questions as we go along, add them to the chat there, and we will either answer them in the chat or we'll talk about them uh, as we go along there. Anything we don't get to, we'll follow up to uh, follow up with in a blog post, and um, we'll send that out with links. Uh, of course, we're being recorded, and the session is going to be available on YouTube later as well. Excuse me, and we'll make the URL available through our normal sort of um, blog posts and other channels too. Okay, so um, first of all, um, I think um, it's time to say hello and to introduce ourselves. So I'm Matt, I'm a developer advocate for JetBrains and I work with the remote development tooling amongst other things. And um, we have a couple of uh, guests with us today as well, um, Martin from JetBrains and Sven from Gitpot. Um, how about introducing yourselves? Martin, why don't you go first? Absolutely. Uh, I'm Martin. I'm a developer advocate here at JetBrains for Space, which is our all-in-one solution for software development teams. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute, I guess, during the webinar. Um, Sven, I guess it's up to you. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm Sven, a co-founder of GetPod. I'm actually an engineer by heart. I love coding so much that I've spent all my time improving that coding experience. And um, so, yeah, looking forward to this webinar. Cool. Um, so uh, I got a feeling that perhaps uh, more people might be a bit more familiar with uh, JetBrains, but based on where we're hosting this, where they might be a bit more familiar with JetBrains and what we do. We build IDEs and other uh, developer tooling. Um, how about telling us a bit more about what Gitpod um, builds and, and Gitpod's history? Yeah, of course. I mean, I hope we cover a lot of the concepts behind that in this webinar, right? So what Gitpod is, is really kind of this ephemeral developer environments that are deployed remotely when you need them. Our claim is always ready to code. So the idea is you, you know, you, you want to be creative, you want to start coding. You should not need to go through all these hassles of setting up, figuring out what kind of tools you need on your local machine, cloning repositories and, and that stuff, but just click a button and start coding in your you know, perfect environment. Great, that sounds, that sounds good. Um, I think you're right, we'll dive into these in a, a little bit more. Um, I think um, it's probably worth us sort of backing up for a second and sort of briefly describing what we're going to be talking about today and the idea of remote development. So I've got a, I've got a little slide here, um, which sort of very brief explanation of what it is that we're talking about. Um, it's, uh, here we go, so re remote development. Um, basically, the idea of what we're talking about here is hosting your source code and your IDE remotely. So your IDE runs where your source is, but you actually still develop locally by using a rich client to connect to this. So um, you've kind of got this, this complete separation going on here. Host, um, source code and IDE and all of your other tooling, compiler dependencies and everything live on a remote machine. And then you can connect to that sort of remotely from uh, a rich client. And we'll dive into that in a little bit more uh, as we're going in here. But I think um, probably uh, one of the sort of first questions we could ask, um, I'd like to, to ask you know, Martin and Sven here, um, is, is why would we be interested in doing remote development? Um, you know, what sort of um, reasons would there be to actually move from, you know, if you've got a, a decent desktop machine, why do you want to suddenly start using remote development and putting all of your source code somewhere else? Who'd like to tackle yeah, that first? I mean, Sven, do you want to dive in? Can I start with just, just kind of the, the obvious things? I mean, setting things up, I already mentioned that. That's, you know, we are wasting so much time in configuration drift and, you know, maintaining configurations. And so on. We, we have already infrastructure as code, right? We have dev pipelines, everything is automated. But when it comes to developer environments, we are still doing the same thing we did in the 90s or even the 80s where you have a readme that is completely outdated usually and then you you know when someone onboards there are, there's a lot of good intentions and so on but that drains through the process you know at the end of the first or second week when you finally have a dev environment you you forgot about what you actually wanted and why you were motivated in the first place and so just eliminating all that i think that's the most obvious thing yeah, I think that's actually um, a very good sort of analogy. We are used to these repeatable environments uh, to work with for, for development, for deployment. 
sorry, um, but we don't necessarily do the same sort of thing for development. And yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's the whole works on my machine and let, let's let's ship Martin's laptop because it's uh, it's working. It's all good. Um, Martin, did you anything you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I think it depends a little bit on what angle you are taking this from. So absolutely the team angle and the developer angle where you can um, sort of set things up and get people on board to do it really quickly. Uh, the other one is that everyone also has that standardized environment, which indeed means that you can ship the machine. Um, but there's another angle, uh, and that is security, for example. Um, if you have people walking around with their developer laptop and you have your billion dollar idea source code on there, your application, and they take the subway and they lose their laptop, what happens? I mean, there is security involved and um, people can probably remote wipe their laptop, but it's a hassle. Why not keep the source code on a server somewhere, work remotely on that server? And even if they lose their laptop, there's nothing on there of value um, except maybe yeah, th their emails or something like that. But the development, the source codes, your IP is going to be on a, on a remote machine somewhere. Yeah, that's so that's... important. I mean, basically, every, you know, these, all these um, VDI solutions out there, Citrix and the like, I mean, that's there because of this problem, right? And I think remote development is a much nicer way with, where you don't have to do make the compromises on developer experience so big. Yeah, exactly. I, I think there's another one as well <clears throat> um, where developers typically like their laptops quite beefy uh, with lots of RAM and fast SSDs and stuff like that. Uh, but very often, um, if you're doing machine learning or AI or something like that, you need powerful graphics cards to calculate everything why would you um, ship a powerful graphics card like that to every one of your developers when they're only using it for eight hours a day, maybe 10 hours a day, uh, when you can just rent those online um, in a virtual machine running somewhere um, that you can use the power of for the time you actually need that? Mm -hmm. I think it's quite telling you're talking about powerful laptops as well. It's, it's, you know, laptops, they're great now and they are really, really good with everything, but they're still not as powerful as a, as a good big desktop machine you know you can still get a much more powerful machine there um but we still like our nice laptops it's, it's more portable and more useful and everything you know i can i can take my laptop down to the coffee shop and um you know i can get some work done but with the remote development kind of thing i could get um you know i, I could be working well i mean i can be picking up some work which are done in my in the office go down to the coffee shop carry on but still using a powerful machine rather than just using my laptop as well so, so yeah, I think that that's good. Um, I think a number of these have really kind of touched on um, what companies would want from uh, remote development. It, what about from a developer's point of view? You know, like an individual developer, why would why would I want to go and use uh, remote development? And we'll an answer for definitely. That also, this you know this automation thing is so mm -hmm. helpful for me. Like personally, I've been working. You know, we we are using GetPod to develop GetPod for I think three years now. And it just feels so nice to start a new dev environment when I want to work on something like a bug fix or a feature and just do my work. And then I, I can just, you know, we do ephemeral, like we, we use them as disposables. Right? Like you create really new developer environments for every task more or less, right? And because everything is automated, you can do that. And we can touch that later also on. But um, this frees me up like big time, for instance, I'm working on a three day feature thing, right? Or multiple day. And then in between, of course, there are colleagues who wanna have a code review for me, for instance. What I usually have to do if I work locally, I have to get stash, you know, check out the other branch, run the build, make sure the tests are okay and so on. I have the same thing, you know, not talking about the setup, just kind of syncing with a, with a branch. And, and so then I go back again. What I do with Skipfod or, or generally remote development is I just go to that pull request or merge request, whatever tool you use, and do a code review with a new dev environment. I leave my feature dev environment just running in parallel. I do that, you know, after an hour, I just close the tab. I can forget about that. I don't need to go back to that any time in the future. I don't need to maintain that, sync that or so. Um, it's it's getting garbage collected automatically by GetPod. And so I go back to my feature and find it as I left it and I can just continue. And this 
this frees me up so much. Like I don't have to yak shave continuously, syncing, maintaining my dev environment and so on. Mm -hmm. That, that that's a that sounds like a very nice workflow to be perfectly honest yeah, um you know you can the the, con, the cost of the context switch uh, to change branches there can be quite excessive especially if you're in the middle of a, like a debugging task you know you could actually from as we could actually just leave it you know paused in the debugger go off and do something else and then come back into that without yeah. having to you know clean things down as you say stash and carry on uh, yeah i like i like the sound of that that, that works for me uh, yeah i think it's even worse uh, like if you're doing database migrations and things like that as well um your environment is typically hooked up to a certain database schema that you may be working on in your development branch and then all of a sudden your colleague comes in you need to update the, da uh, the database or downgrade the database schema um add some sample data things like that whereas with a remote environment you can just um, yeah, log in and start working on that exact version of the code but also of um, all of the things that are involved like a database for example yeah really good point yeah yeah and yeah there, there's also the fact that um, for example i'm working on a plugin for uh, writer one of our ids that we have uh, and one of the things there is if i want to do a fresh build or a fresh clone of writer it means downloading a couple of gigabytes of uh, code from Git uh, internally, which means if I'm on a train, if I'm uh, in the airport or wherever, and I want to quickly work on something, that's not going to work. Like 20 gigabytes over a bad connection is not going to work. Whereas with remote development, I can simply connect to that Git, uh, Git workspace and start working on it immediately because nothing is on my machine. I don't need a full clone. I don't need anything on my machine. Uh, except the clients to be able to connect to the remotes. Yeah. This and another aspect, actually, nice. which is also, oh, sorry, Mark. Uh, no. Another aspect I just wanted to touch on is like the, you know, you can actually use any kind of device because of, you know, of course, when you are coding on a feature, you want to have the full flash power of IntelliJ, you know, you use a desktop ID you, you want to use or whatever kind of user you are. But if, you know, there like our CTO, Chris, had a, this case that he was on call and he was on a, on a ride with his motor by, uh, bicycle. And so he got, he got a message and he had to solve that from, from his phone. And he was able to do that, actually, you know, with Gitpod. Like, you know, not, nothing serious, just a story. But it's, you know, it's just nice that you, you're able to do that. So, you know, maybe not from your phone, but from an iPad, if you are, you know, you, you can really do at least code reviews work super well and small changes and so on. That's that's all good, right? Uh -huh. that's that's really putting the remote into remote development, isn't it? It's, it's like we don't we don't tend yeah. to uh, do too much from the back of a motorcycle, but uh, there we go. Um, we, we've actually got um, a good question come in, um, which sort of fits in exactly with what we're talking about right now. And um, is the question is why do I need a remote server for all of this that we're talking about, as opposed to just for instance. Uh, a container that I can download um, that does the same thing on my local machine. So this would be like re reproducible environments. Why use a remote server and remote development like we're talking about instead of just having containers? Yeah, I mean, we, we are going to touch that. But the thing is, you want to be ready to code, right? And so mm -hmm. for that matter, you need to be able to just, you know, get the things you need in place and running so what is a, you know, a re reasonably large project it has lots of source code, it has all the dependencies, it has, you know, the additional services you need to run, like caches, web servers, databases, and so on. You can put that into an image, but then pulling that image is quite a thing, right? So if we, we could prepare a kind of an automated kind of CI thing that would create this Docker images and then you would locally you know i want to work on this branch so you start pulling the image but if it, you know it, it takes a lot of time and so i think that's one of the the things is remote thing like the, you know the the bigger lever probably is also kind of you could just scale in all kind of dimensions you want um what martin just uh, also touched on is you know the, if you need gpu power and so on but only this is just um if you you are if you are sure you have an internet connection, it's just nicer to pre-pull everything in the cloud because there the infrastructure is just so much faster and and, and more reliable. 
Um, I wonder if we ch change tack a little bit here. I wonder if we could talk about how remote development has changed, um, I guess, o over the years, because I think we've probably, well, I mean, I can remember, for example, when virtual machines first came in, we're going to start working locally with virtual machines to have these reproducible environments. And it was awful, <laughs> you know, because the support wasn't there for virtual machines at the time. Um, how has remote development evolved over, over this kind of time as well? Because I think the tooling now isn't the same as what it would have been back then. Yeah, I think similar to what you re remember, um, I've also been working at customers where uh, you would have to go to internal IT with an external um, hard drive, still a spinning one, uh, connect it to their USB port and then get the latest image for that week with all of the development tools and all that. Then you could take it along, run a VM on your machine from that external drive and then get started with, uh, with work, which was horrible and something I would never ever want to go back to. Um, I think the next worst thing is probably um, using the same, but on a remote machine somewhere. So using uh, Citrix or remote desktop or something like that, mm -hmm. where you General would remote into. Kind of yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's it's better because you no longer have to run the VM on your machine, but you're still working on a remote machine. Very often there's a really heavy antivirus uh, things installed on those machines. Sometimes it, it was like a remote desktop where lots of people were sharing the exact same server and things would get slow if someone was doing something crazy. So really, um, yeah, not ideal. And I think in terms of where remote development went or is going is into exact that spot where you can um, just connect to an environment somewhere that is running and have a ready-to-go IDE, not a ready-to-go desktop, but a ready-to-go IDE that you can work with, uh, start coding in and use the tools that the IDE has to offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one yeah, of the, I think one there of the key are things... I'm oh, sorry, man. Yeah, go on, Sven. All right, there, I just wanted to say there is another angle to this. Like there are a couple of developments that led to what we have now with um, JetBrain Space and GitPod. That is also on the tooling side, all these web IDE things that happened in the past, right? Where people like Cloud9 pioneered a lot of things. Uh, mm -hmm. Lots of people might remember. And, and so that was, you know, it, it, just a little early, like very ambitious, but, you know, it, it just, um, didn't fulfill all its promises, like people who were, you know, ex had experience with uh, JetBrain's IDE were just not happy, like, like they hit the glass ceiling of such a web IDE. But we have other tech now that, you know, just does that nicely. And we, in the, in the, in the, in the past, also, what the remote development in IDEs were, like if I talk, uh, think about Eclipse and also earlier JetBrains was mo mostly like SSH-based file syncing stuff and so on. That just didn't feel well, like f f feel good. But the new architecture where you have a front end and a back end that is running remotely. So all the smartness is running in the container, wherever that is. And then you have a protocol that just sends the, you know, the information that was computed with, based on you know the heavy language infrastructure indexes and so on, that just makes a lot of sense and just make provides a developer experience that is on par with what you have locally. And I think that's that has been a super important step here. So we now can use you know the, the mainstream IDEs in such a scenario without this kind of file sync um, scenarios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is um, important to sort of to, to see the changes that have happened there that we've gone from this uh, sort of terminal services where remote desktop effectively now to a remote application and the, the application yeah. isn't, as you say, syncing stuff. You're still kind of working locally, but trying to make it also work remotely. We are doing uh, having everything uh, remotely and the clients that you use is is local. Um, but it's still not sort of remote desktop anymore. It's, it's more, um, you know, you're not throwing graphics around trying to sort of um, make that work. So it, it helps with latency there as well. It also helps we've got better networks these days as well. Um, I think before we move on to sort of uh, having a look at some uh, sort of some of the solutions, some of the demos, um, I think um, really, I guess a question would be, um, what do you think has stopped organizations uh, from moving towards de a remote desktop now? And why would they want to uh, pick these up now, I guess. 
Uh, I think it, there was just a lack of solu proper solutions. Um, a dev environment is a complex thing, right? You have an interactive, you know, debuggable, you know, you, you know all the things we, we use locally, that like it's a multitude of tools that they need to work together in, 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 in good orchestration and so on. Um, that hasn't been there before, specifically also because, you know, JetBrains haven't had remote support, things like uh, also, you know, tools like VS Code or Eclipse don't have this proper. And so you would ha always have these very simplified um, web IDEs and that just doesn't cut it for developers, like for professional developers. They need they need proper tools. Mm -hmm. And so that I think that was the biggest barrier. And then also things like in the back end, Kubernetes, for instance, and all the, like all the things that have been developed in the past years in container, VMs and so on, cloud, has helped you know enable this big time so I, this is just like the idea you know it's not it's obvious that we want to do that right but we don't want to compromise on very important things like developer experience and so mm -hmm. for that we needed to really nail down like the tack and and, and, and and solve that and i'm super happy to see that like JetBrains embracing that github embracing that with their code spaces thing and so, you know we are now really in a time where you know this happens we we can do that finally. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 sorry, Martin, go. Yeah, I just wanted to add. I think it's also a, a bit of changing attitudes from uh, all companies and developers as a, as a whole, because everyone is developing in um, in a remote way. In in some regards, uh, they're using GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket or Space or whatever uh, to host their sources. So why not have the developer machines running there as well? It's it's a small step from there because you're probably also even doing CI/CD on those platforms. Um, why not take the next step and also put uh, put the developer machines in there? Yeah, all these tools have been developed well over the last couple of years, and, and they, they are working really well for sort of deployment and stuff. So I think it, it makes sense to to move development towards it as well, which is good. Um, Sven, last one, I think. Um, quick question: you, You've mentioned using Gitpod to work with Gitpod, um, so uh, you know, sort of working uh, remote development tooling to to help build remote development stuff. There, what kind of applications are a good fit for remote development? Is it is it everything, or does it kind of really Depend. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you can not only build GitPod with GitPod, but also some other applications. Um, so that's good. Um, like, I think it is the same for space, but please, Martin, correct me if I'm wrong. But currently, we are concentrating on everything that runs in Linux containers, mostly. Uh, so you can, you know, Docker, Docker. Um, use a Docker file to describe your dev environment. Of course, you can run also Docker in Docker there. So if you have additional services, you can just you know spin them up, pre-pull them, prepare everything. Uh, you can even do UI development if it's Linux based. So um, IntelliJ could be built in in, in GitPod as well. If you need to do you know, I mean, gaming is not really current. Like, theoretically, that's all doable. It's just not that we are focusing on that. Not, we are not focusing um, heavily on GPU. That's actually something we are going to do very soon, um, allowing people to pick GPUs and so on. So also f that's uh, especially interesting for data science uh, applications. And another use case that we don't really focus on at the moment, but would be super interesting is mobile development, where you have various different operating systems and because it's just so painful, same applies to hardware, I would say. You know, that is kind of, you have a lot of painful configuration in those areas and uh, it's just a matter of time, not whether that's possible or not. Yeah, exactly. I, I think anything that is, uh, is is a web API or a web application or anything that runs in a console has to talk to a database. Things like that are uh, easy to do with the current technology that is that is about. Uh, if you're doing GUI developments like uh, Windows Forms or a, a Swing application in Java, that will work, as you say. Uh, but it still means that you have to configure some way of showing the actual UI on a desktop. So I, I think. Uh, Sven, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think you guys have a VNC server that you can use to show those things in the browser. Uh, with space, we don't have that out of the box, but you could do something similar. But it means 
that there's some setup involved. Um, as long as you're doing anything that doesn't need a desktop like that, it's probably fine to, to develop your application in, in remote environments. Yeah, the VNC thing is not something we have built into the product, actually. It's just, you know, you can use any Docker image. And so if you put in VNC, and, and it works. Um, yeah, so, so um, we kind of uh, very much agree, really, on the types of uh, applications that you could work with. Like Web-based applications are, are sort of, well, socket-based are, are simply the best, you know, can, uh, console, um, socket. Um, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, yeah, I think things like you know user interfaces are, that are a bit trickier, and mobile is definitely something we'd like to uh, work on as well. And these these are things which we're we're working towards. Um, I think now we we'll might move on and actually have a look at what um, JetBrains has got in the remote development uh, space. Uh, no pun intended. Sorry. Um, we uh, we have a, a feature which can work with both Gitpod and Space, and a set of functionality uh, which we call um, we call Gateway. And this is our sort of remote desktop feature, which is bundled with all of the IDEs is pretty much that we've got. And um, I think we'll have a look at that. So I've got, a, I've got another slide uh, here, excuse me. And if we just pop onto the next one, uh, there it is. Um, so so this, this is kind of like a very um, nice, simple overview of what we've got with, uh, with Gateway going on here. The idea is that we've basically split the IDE into two. We've got a back end of the IDE which runs on the remote machine. And this does everything apart from showing a user interface. It will load the project, it will compile it, it will do all of the uh, language processing, it indexes, it provides syntax highlighting, it does navigation, all that, but there's no user interface at all. So it talks to all your source code, uh, which is on the machine. It uses all the tooling that's on the machine, all the dependencies, uh, and that is all living remotely. On the local side of things, we've got two components. We've got uh, JetBrains Gateway and what we call JetBrains Client. And the idea here is that Gateway, as the name suggests, is the, the whole thing which manages everything. It's the, the, the gateway to the whole set of functionality. It is bundled with IntelliJ IDEA and the other IDEs. So if you've got an IDE installed on your machine already, you can just set up a connection and get going. Um, or alternatively, you can download a little standalone app called JetBrains Gateway, funnily enough. And this will provide the connection and do all the management for you. So if you've got a laptop, which all you want to do is remote development on, you don't have to install IDEA or C-Line or WebStorm or whatever. You can just install Gateway and it'll start working there. So Gateway manages the connection between the local side and the remote side. And um, it also uh, manages starting up and connecting the JetBrains clients. This is our rich client now, which will talk to the uh, remote server. So you end up with a local user interface that is talking to the remote backend. And the local user interface, it's built on, well, I'll, I'll talk about it when I, when I show that in a sec. Um, in fact, let's switch over to my screen and I'll show you Gateway uh, up and running now. So. So this is Gateway as a standalone application. If you are used to IntelliJ IDEA, you'll possibly recognize this welcome screen as well. You'll, this is where you'll find the functionality in IDEA, but this is standalone. Um, on the, the main page there, you've got a number of different ways of connecting to a remote machine. We can connect via space, we can connect via Gitpod. Martin and Sven will talk about that shortly. I'm gonna talk about the um, very simple um, way of doing things, which is just with an SSH connection. So um, at the end of the day, Gateway just needs some sort of connection to the remote machine. And we've got various different connectors which can manage this for us. We've got a space one, which will talk to the space backend, and uh, similarly, Gitpod. Um, but we can also work with an SSH connection. Uh, so I'll use that now. So I'll just click new connection there. And I can from here, I can just set up a simple SSH connection, usual sort of dialogue that we've got there. We can connect to any remote machine which is running SSH. We use Linux. Um, we're looking to work with Windows and Mac uh, in the future, um, fairly shortly, hopefully. Uh, but right now we're working with uh, Linux and I've got a couple of items already set up there. I got I can work with a virtual machine there. I've got a couple of Ubuntu servers running in uh, EWS. Now I just need to make sure I select the right one, otherwise it's not gonna work. Um, and we can connect there via SSH. You can connect with username and password or with uh, SSH pairs or, and all that kind of stuff. And once we've set up a connection, we click next. This will, um, the gateway will connect to the machine and it will see what's already installed on there. See if this IDE backend is already there. And we can see all the different items which we can install. We can install in IDEA, C line, GoLand, and so on. Uh, and we can see here now that um, IntelliJ IDEA is actually already installed. 
If it wasn't installed, Gateway will go off and install it for us, which is nice. Now we have to tell um, the IDE backend to open a project. So I can click on the browse button there. I get to see the remote file system, which is nice. And I can select my Spring Pet Clinic sample, which is there. If we don't have that, I can quickly open up a, a, um, a terminal and do git clone and on we go. See, it's just nice and simple. Select the item there and then we can just click um, the next button there. What Gateway will do now is it'll make sure that the IDE is installed and running on the remote machine, and it will then um, download and cache and start running the client and join the two together. So we can see here now we've got the client running, and you might recognize it. It looks very much like IntelliJ. And one of the fun things about demoing remote uh, development is showing you stuff that looks just like you're used to in a local environment. But here we've got a remote development uh, item going on here. We can see up in the top left here, we've got a little control panel, which is showing us where I'm connected to, and it's showing us some stats about my back end. Uh, it was just complaining about some latency there. So I, I think uh, my son might have started gaming, which is, um, which is going to be fun. But it will also notify you about CPU load, memory, and disk usage, and it'll keep you abreast of what's going on with your resource usage. Other than that, it looks and feels just like um, a, a normal IntelliJ uh, idea session because it basically is IntelliJ idea. This is a, a local version of and a very lightweight version of uh, IntelliJ. And you've got your um, editor here, which is just the normal editor. And it's it's all pretty much what you're used to. Because it's a local application, you can customize it. So you can put on whatever theme you like. Um, you can also install some plugins which work with the editor. So for example, I've got uh, IntelliJ, uh, sorry, I've got IdeaVim here. So I can you know start typing with my you know, hello, I'm in Vim, and then I know how to quit, so that that's good. You know, you can just do Control Q. We're safe. We're good, and um, we can just work with the, the files uh, as you'd expect. You can install key maps. You can install custom themes here, and when you um, if you open up the the preferences, you can see if you go to the plugins here, we've got two plugins items. One which is just for local plugins on the front end, and then we've got plugins on the host. So I can actually add. Um, extra functionality to my host IDE. So if I want to add in extra syntax highlighting, extra inspections, I can install those and uh, and keep going. Once we're working, we've got all the sort of normal things that you'd expect, uh, shift, shift to navigate around. So I can search for a pet controller. Once I'm in there, I can view and see what um, methods I've got and I can jump around uh, like normal. I can do uh, find usages on things and I'll see the results displayed down the bottom there. So I can do lots and lots of normal sort of rich uh, functionality from uh, IntelliJ. You know, I've got normal sorts of things like uh, typing with uh, code completion and I get the normal sort of uh, completion going on there. I'd have uh, errors. So if I've got a typo going on in there and it doesn't resolve it, it'll highlight it in red for me and I can hover over and it says it can't recognize it. We've also got, you know, the, the um, um, version control as well. So I can see the diffs of what's going on there. And in fact, um, let me just uh, reset that. And if we go down to the Git tool window here, we can see the changes, the, the local changes that are happening. We can look at the log view as well, and we get uh, a fairly, you know, fairly normal uh, log view of what's going on there. I can select an item and see the, the diff as it was when it was being done. And as ever when demoing this, it's always important to say that all of this is happening remotely. So we haven't downloaded any files down to the local machine. This is all being run on the remote machine. And just the information that we need is being passed to the thin client here to be able to show stuff. So there's no syntax highlighting happening locally. It's all being done by the remote machine. Um, items like the structure view uh, still work. Uh, I've got my um, run configurations, uh, some Maven projects. So I've got my Maven uh, details going on here as well, and um, lots of different terminals as well. I've got a spring, uh, so tool windows, um, spring tool window. I've got a terminal as well, and obviously this is my remote machine, so I'm actually on my uh, Ubuntu server in uh, AWS, and that just works as you'd expect, and I can work with that. Uh, and then, of course, I can run the application as well. And if I click Run there, it's going to make sure everything's up to date. I added a comment, so it's just going to quickly rebuild. And this is building um, the Spring Pet Clinic sample, which is a web uh, server, um, a web application. 
and therefore I want to be able to connect to it. And one of the nice things that um, Gateway will do and the, the Rich Client is it will recognize when your application is running on the remote machine and when it's opened ports as well. And then I can just click on the port which has been opened there and do forward port and open in browser, which has opened on another screen here. One sec, let me just pull that over. There it is. And you can see um, our normal uh, spring pet clinic item there with the cute picture of animals. Um, but it's not just, of course, uh, running things as well. I can use the debug button and I can just click that to re uh, uh, to restart. And if I just go to owner controller, owner controller, and if I go to process inform, and oh, okay, I've already got a breakpoint in there ready for me there. That'll uh, resolve in a sec once this is started running. Again being warned about latency in my control center. But then if I forward to port and open the browser, there it is, and I can do my find. And if I just start typing surname there, we then just hit the breakpoint as you'd expect. And again, everything's happening on the remote machine, but I'm getting the normal sort of uh, idea functionality that you'd expect in the uh, rich client there. I can uh, have a look at owner, I can hover over this, I can see all the values there, I can click, I can see the value that was being uh, passed in. And of course I can um, you know, step, step over, uh, step into and debug just as you'd expect to be able to debug. We've got the call stack and everything. Um, finally, um, just want to show testing. So in fact, let's just jump straight to owner controller tests. There it is. So again, we get the normal sort of syntax highlighting. And of course, we get the fact that idea has recognized that these are tests. I can click the um, the gutter icon there, I think. There it is. Oh, I just got the pop-up. And I click the pop-up there, and it says run. And I can run that. It'll make sure everything's up to date. And it will run my tests. Yes, I always want to download the pre-built indexes. That's good. It'll run my tests, make sure everything's uh, OK. And I should get a nice set of green going on there. Any second now, or oh, they've, they've, there we are, there we're hidden. There we go. And we've got green tests, and we're all good. Um, and so that's um, like a, a very quick overview of what um, of what it looks like using Gateway. There, we can connect very easily to um, an SSH server. Um, Gateway is in control of everything. It'll download the IDs for you. It'll make sure it's up and running. It'll make sure the client is download, downloaded and cached correctly, and uh, set everything all up and, and start talking together. So um, that is sort of working with an, uh, an SSH connection. But I think the um, what one of the downsides to that really is that you, you can you can try that yourself now. You can you can go and work with that and work quite happily with a remote machine. I can do it with virtual machine on my desktop. I can use an AWS machine. I could use a um, a proper server that I've got under my desk. Um, but I have to manage it all myself. And so we, we don't get any of the benefits of the things that we were talking about with our sort of uh, automation and our orchestration. And I think let's just sort back to that. If we, can we bring everyone else back in? There we go. And um, I think it would be uh, useful really to, to have a chat really about some of the more interesting things that we can do with, with orchestration as well. So. We can, of course, use these uh, the, the tools that we've got to work with uh, to generate uh, environments. But we've all got development environments that are slightly more complex. So things like um, you know, sort of database servers and stuff like that. So, so how can uh, I just want to ask the the, the other two here? Is like how can we work with uh, things like that in in you know more complex setup than just my simple SSH server that I have to manage myself um, to work with uh, a more complex environment. Yeah, it's really like cool, to... Matt, that the, all this stuff works uh, now in, in IntelliJ. Just before we go into the orchestration part, is there anything that doesn't work as well as with local IntelliJ at the moment, that it's still under development somewhat? Or because everything, it seems like everything works. I've, I've been using um, JetBrains uh, IntelliJ myself. and. Uh, I don't see any compromise there. 
Well, the idea is not to have any compromise. So um, the, this, this, the, the way the, the gateway works is kind of been based on the way that the tooling that we've built over several years, really, it, 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 starting way back with when um, Rider first came out, which Rider's just had its fifth birthday, because Rider has a .NET backend um, and a IntelliJ Java based uh, front end. And so we've, we've been working on this sort of splitting the IDE into two for quite a while. We've taken what we learned with Rider, we put that into the code with me feature, the, the collaborative editing. Um, but code with me required a huge amount of architectural changes within the IDE to sort of split things apart. Um, and therefore we couldn't address all of the sort of functionality in the, uh, the IDE. We, we kind of had to approach the things that made sense for when you invite a guest to, to work collaboratively with you. Um, with remote mm. development, we've then taken all that further on. And instead of, we don't have collaborative editing yet, we'd like to, um, but we've then been able to take it further on. And then uh, the idea is we, we should be able to work with all of the idea, uh, all of the dialogues, all of the tool windows, all of the features that um, are working in the uh, in the IDE. The, there are definitely areas which are still uh, still not there. We've still got a bit of a beta tag, but we're getting very, very close to, to pulling that beta tag off, really. It's, um, it's looking really good. Cool. Yeah. I have really good experience with that, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> uh, so coming back to your question, I think the main thing... Um, is what you did, what you showed, like it's really like IntelliJ IDEA is able to give you a proper developer experience, even though your backend or your just whole, like the developer environment is remotely, right? Um, but just moving everything you did locally to a remote place doesn't help with getting rid of this you know, these yak shaving, continuously syncing, configuring, and so on. I mean, the, the, the VM is probably based on a Docker image or something like that. So that helps a bit. But then, you know, you do that once and then you invest. Like you, you do the Git pull, like the Git clone, and then you run the build, and then you download the backend for IntelliJ. And so you have this so much investment in this developer environment that you are not want to get rid of it anytime soon. So you still have a one thing per project that you would, or maybe you have two or so, but you wouldn't go all, all the way in automation and really do ephemeral developer environments where you, you know, throw them away easily because it's still costly to set them up and maintain them somewhat, you know, at least waiting time that is, right? And I think that's where, you know, where, where solutions like Space and GetPod come into play. Um, also, of course, other things like collaboration and so on. But uh, I think that's the main thing. Like, that's the idea of ephemeral developer environments. They get prepared asynchronously, like a CI system, continuously. And they are always ready for you. They are waiting there. And they are, you know, they are based on the automation that works. Automation needs to run regularly. Otherwise, it also drifts apart and doesn't work. We all know that, right? And uh, I think that's um, the main thing here. Like that's the main difference. Yeah, I think to, to add on to that, um, we talked about it earlier in this webinar, that's uh, the benefit of having remote development <clears throat> is that you um, get environments that you can easily spin up and uh, switch down. Like you say, ephemeral um, development environments. In this case, connecting to an SSH server somewhere, if all of a sudden, um, a colleague walks in and asks you to uh, check their pull requests and uh, and look into the code that they're working on. You haven't really solved the issue of being able to switch quickly to that branch and quickly check that out and uh, see what is going on there. You still have to uh, switch branches, maybe tear down the database, tear down the database migrations, go there before you can do that. So I think um, with that SSH server, you definitely solved uh, the issue of having additional capacity where you can essentially spin up any AWS or Azure or G uh, GCP virtual machine with uh, whatever hardware you want, but you still have this issue of having to maintain everything and uh, not being able to switch easily between branches or types of environments. Mm -hmm. um, so how about you show us how Space handles that then, Martin? Um, and how we can deal with some of these questions about automation and how that works with the IDE itself because the IDE is going to have certain requirements as well, isn't it? 
That's a great question. So I guess we can uh, we can do some screen sharing. All right. Uh, so what you're seeing here is space. Uh, for those of you that don't know space yet, uh, space is an all-in-one solution for software development teams, a little bit like um, you would see GitHub Enterprise or GitLab or something like that, where you can have uh, multiple projects. Projects can have uh, source repositories. You can do uh, Git hosting, issue tracking, CI, CD. There's a package registry. So you want to, uh, if you want to upload your Maven artifacts or NuGet packages or Docker images, you can do that in space as well. And it's really about working together in an environment in your organization on everything related to software projects. So uh, what you see here is a Git repository that I have in uh, one of the projects here. And uh, actually I actually have two, and that's why I have multiple tabs open here. Uh, this project is just a Git repository with nothing added. Um, but still, if you have a Git repository in space, what you can do is from anywhere you are, whether you are in the uh, repository itself or in a code review or something like that, you can open an IDE. And that's annoying. This is why you still need connectivity, of course. Uh, so you can open an IDE, and when that happens, you can start working um, or configure the environments that you want to have. I'm just going to quickly refresh there and hope it works afterwards. Nice. <laughs> um, I can maybe show it from within Gateway then. Um, so in Gateway, in uh, JetBrains Gateway, in the clients, you can also connect to space and you can set up your environments there as well. So I actually have a couple of them running already, but if you don't have them yet, um, you can create a new environment from there. Um, select the repository you want to work with. So let's say this restaurant service, you pick the branch you want to work with, it can be um, one of the merge requests that are open or um, yeah, let's, let's take this one. Um, you see that there's this concept of dev files. Let's ignore those for a second. Uh, next thing you do is you pick the IDE you want to work with. So let's say IntelliJ, um, we can pick the instance type, regular, large, extra large, depending on what type of uh, CPU and memory you want. And then you hit create environments. One minute later, space will for you spin up that environment on an actual VM for your, um, your own environment. So you're really isolated from everyone there in terms of resources. And when that spins up, you'll see the same thing happen. This is actually uh, on the same repository. The IDE spins up and you can start working with it. Uh, you will see that I can browse the sources that are in there. I can open the terminal as well. So if I want to do, uh, uh, let's say, uptime or- Martin. Up or whatever. Martin, he's doing things. that voice thing again. It's doing that voice thing again. This is fantastic. Uh -huh. But Martin has okay. a small history with webinars of where his um, his microphone randomly and only ever during a webinar starts to go into robot mode. Exactly. I am going to, um, I can maybe switch microphones if that helps. Let's see. Yep, see how that goes. Let's take this one. There will be a little bit more echo, I guess, but um, yeah, I guess we can work through it. Is that better? Yeah, that's good. Yes, yes, we, we can cool. we can do with that. It's not as good, but good. All right, so um, this is the environment. I have everything that you just showed on the SSH server. I can even open the codes and look through it. Um, and while this image is running- uh, Martin, Martin, I'm has... sorry. Uh, Martin, that's, that's not working. It's not the microphone, it's clearly the connection. I'm sorry. Fantastic. Do you, do you want to um, try again with the browser and perhaps um, We'll we'll ask Sven to have a look at we'll have a look at some Gitpod stuff while you're restarting. Sounds Would that good. be all right? Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, yeah, with Martin, it it happens randomly. We've got no idea why. Um, but yes, yeah, Sven. Um, how about showing us some of uh, of uh, what Gitpod has to offer, um, and then we can come back and see what Martin's were uh, working on. Yeah, sure. Super strange. Like yesterday, we did a rehearsal. Nothing. There was really nothing, right? And now, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe you should stop talking about that issue, with, and then it also maybe disappears <laughs> at some point. Um, all right. So yeah, uh, let me give you just uh, another brief overview of Gitpod. Gitpod is open source. I think that's a very important uh, message, and it is also 
open, like it's really focusing only on the developer, um, remote developer um, thing and not kind of, you know, there's, there's no CI integrated, no Git hoster and so on. And so therefore it works with any Git hoster that is popular out there. So you can use it with GitHub, you see a button here. So that's a kind of the URL. You can look at that and we also have a community where you can hang out and, and help. Um, but I'm not going to do the demo on Gitpod itself because it would be side tracking. You know, of course it has a proper configuration. I mean, I maybe show that just to snow everyone here. In the root of the repository, you would put in a Gitpod YAML and the Gitpod YAML shows the configuration. So this is of course a more involved project. This is Gitpod, um, distributed application, lots of different you know, Kubernetes, um, some Go components and types of components. So, so a bit more complex. Uh, let's switch to a more simple thing so you can focus on what is important. The idea is you are working on these kind of platforms. You know, you're working on issues, pull requests, merge requests, whatever you have. And then at some point you just want to start coding. You just want to, you, you need a dev environment for any reason. Not only because you are a developer and you really want to debug something or code something, but maybe also you are a tester or a product manager and there are reasons you want to have a dev environment, right? So this is, you know, I don't want to, I don't like using this kind of um, term, but it's democratizing uh, kind of development because everyone can just click this button here and gets a fully working developer environments for this project, right? So what Gitpod actually does is, uh, what the button does is it prefixes the URL with gitpod.io hash. And so then it looks at what is after the hash and analyzes the repository. It looks for the Gitpod YAML. Maybe it's registered already as a project. Maybe it has pre-builds. Um, so I, I can cover what pre-builds do in a second. And then it, it creates a container for you in the background that is already fully initialized or what we call ready to code. So because I have configured Gitpod to open up IntelliJ IDEA, uh, I can show you here, you can configure that, whatever IDE you prefer, you can um, pick that. We also have Golang, PyCharm, PHP Storm. You can also use VS Code there's always a web-based version of that as well. And you can also SSH into um, any of your developer environments. Uh, but I have picked uh, um, IntelliJ IDEA, so it opens up and IntelliJ asked me to you know, spin up the dev environment here. It's now using, again, Gateway, which we have already seen uh, in the demo of Matt, and it's doing exactly the same, uh, the same thing here. So we just get this you know, and what you see here is the server is already running. And we've also had a, um, a full build, a full Maven build, like all the dependencies are, have been downloaded and so on. And this didn't happen right now when I started the dev environment, but it happened when the last user pushed on, on that branch. So it's like a CI CD system. Gitpod will listen on any commits and then it prepares dev environments asynchronously for you and so that when a developer comes along and wants to code or do a code review or whatever, everything is there already and you just spin it up and you use it. And when you're done, you just close it and you, 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 know, you, don't, you don't need to go back anywhere. Just, I, I just close it and then I'm done. And for the next task, for instance, if I want to do a pull request or, you know, this is GitLab same project, you know, I could just start a dev environment again, or I can do that in parallel and so on. So you might wonder where the button in GitHub comes from. That comes from a browser extension that you have to install, like you see it here. In GitLab, we have a native integration, so you don't need to in install the browser extension, but GitLab has that enabled. So it's just one of the options you can do for coding here. Um, actually, GitLab, themselves, they use also get part for development. So this is a GitLab is also open core, right? So they have the source code and they have also a reasonably even more complex, I would say than the get part one, um, get part YAML where, you know, all the pre-built configuration and, and so on is, is going on. Um, 
there's a lot of things you know to discover. You can self-host GitPod. You can use SaaS. GitPod IO, of, of course, is a SaaS version that connects with GitLab, Bitbucket, GitHub, and even your self-hosted GitLab. So you can register them, and then you can use GitPod IO for that. But if that all doesn't fit, you need AirGap or whatever, you just install GetPod on your own um, servers and connect that to whatever you have um, in your uh, organization. And I think that was a kind of super quick because I'm cautious. Of, uh, I, I see we have only have five minutes left and I want to give uh, Martin some airtime. Um, maybe if there is a question, I'd be happy to take them. But otherwise, I would hand over to Martin. Um, I, I think we'll we'll skip back to Martin quite quickly, but I just want to comment that that's really cool. I really like the whole idea of just just closing down uh, gateway, closing down the browser, and that's it. You know, it's it's so nice and easy to to spin up a, a new instance, uh, work with it, and then throw it away. You know, that, that's that's a very different way of working. I think, and I think it could be very powerful. Yeah, so, yeah that's how yeah, automation. Nice. You know, that's mm -hmm. what automation brings us. Yeah. But it's, it's that idea of the ephemeral um, environments is is uh, a different way of thinking about it, I think, which is which is mm -hmm. cool. Um, Martin, how are you doing? How's your voice? I, I hope it's all uh, working out again. Um, nope. Uh, damn it. That's better. Let's, let's give it a go for two minutes and we'll, let's see. All right. So it, it's working, right? Right so, now, um, yes. So what I wanted to mention is um, that the environment that I spun up as a default in space, so this one, is the one that is based on the Docker image that we have in space uh, that gives you some JDK, some .NET tooling, uh, some Node tooling and all that. Um, um, but of course, it doesn't have everything that you may want to have. So if you, uh, if, if you open up the project here, you will see that I still have to download the uh, JDK on this machine. So I have to go in there and then um, work with that and install it here. So there's, there's still some things that I have to do to get set up and get started with things. Um, the alternative that you can do is if in space you create this dev file.yaml, what you can do is set some defaults for your environment. So first of all, I can set the fact that my uh, default ID is going to be IntelliJ IDEA. And the next thing I can do is also specify that I want to have a Docker file that is going to serve as the base of uh, the environment that I, I have. think I think we might have to pause again, Martin. Yes. We, we've got an echo. There is an echo. Okay, let's try this. <laughs> so, um, I have the environment here, I have that dev file, and from that dev file, I can also specify that I want to uh, use a Docker file as the base image. Now that Docker file is um, probably like Sven just showed in, uh, in Gitpod, is how I want my environment to be. And whenever I next start, um, start working on this environment, I want to have this container as the base. So what I'm doing Martin, here is, I, to say it, I think we have to go, I think we have to stop. Base that will be there out of the box on this machine. Um, there's going to be some tools that I want to work with maybe out of the box as well. And when I launch this one uh, in space, you will see that this is actually there. I now have a terminal where I can use this Gaussé and let's, uh, let's say audio and I have this tool installed. So again, it is really about customizing your environments to something that you want to start with. And with that, I guess I'll uh, hand over because I see a lot of uh, echo comments in the chat here and I can't hear you right now. Well, uh, sorry about that. Just to cause even more mayhem, that was a problem at my end, and I was getting an echo, getting an which echo. nobody else was. So uh, it's, it's yes. Um, I, I, one thing I'd like to ask, Martin, um, because I, I kind of got distracted with the echo there, did you get to cover the, the warm-up uh, side of things? Uh, no, really not yet, actually. Useful. Um, that is something else there indeed. Uh, so you can specify what the base image of your uh, container is going to be of the environment that you want to work with. But there's another thing that you can do and that is can configure warm up in uh, space. So the next thing you can do is that space will then um, spin up that Docker file for you. 
install the IDE onto the environment that is being created, uh, make sure that your sources are cloned, and then make sure that indexes are pre-warmed and you can immediately start using navigation and all that. On top of that, if you say are building a React application, you need to download half the internet using NPM. You can do that as well as part of the warm-up so that next time you start up that environment, all of that will be already available on the machine and you no longer have to jump through those hooks whenever you start working. Yeah, and I think this is a really powerful thing of being able to have a pre-built environment which has got all your dependencies and also got the IDE ready to go so you're not sitting there waiting for it to index or anything. You can even make it compile so you literally start up and you're, you're good. You know, you could yeah, hit run right. and it'll be ready to go. Um, it's very powerful. Okay, I think we are um, almost out of time. I think we, we should just uh, do a little bit of uh, roundup. And um, I, get, I guess uh, what would be uh, your closing comments? What would be the, the one thing that you would uh, hope that somebody would take away from this, this session? <clears throat> Sven, uh, you so you wanted... For me, yeah, for me, I mean, it's just uh, my mission is to tell everyone that this is, you know, this is now the time finally that we can solve this last piece and move this last piece of the developer pipeline into the cloud and put it into, you know, into the whole pipeline. Like everything is in, is already automated, centralized, secured, but then we put, move out the source code and have these black box situations of, we don't know what happens on the local machines, you know, people messing around trying to replicate what, what the software system needs to, needs to run. And then also, you know, in these days doing that from coffee shops all over the world and with very insecure networks running that software, you know, that, that all together um, solves kind of a really big, big problem, like not only in, in terms of developer experience and efficiency, but also in terms of security. And I think the only reason we haven't in like the mainstream hasn't adopted that is because the solutions weren't there and they are now there. Like we have that now, like, you know, all the big developer tools, um, vendors are working on that. Um, GitPod has been working on that for four years. You know, it's just, um, it's there. Um, and you know, just let's embrace that and 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 make developer development of software more fun and you know just uh, collaborative. Exactly. Um, I, I would like to add on top of that that um, we are now used to scripting and setting up our infrastructure on production using um, scripting, Terraform, Docker, Kubernetes, and all that. And I think with the fact that remote development is now ready for prime time, all of the tools are there, um, that it's time for us as developers to also start getting used to scripting and um, making our environments reproducible instead of uh, just having our one customized machine that can only do one thing at the same time. Um, why not make it so that our team can get started working on the same thing uh, out of the box with the same environments? And that if we have to all of a sudden switch branches or work on something else, um, that it's also easy to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's um, it's just great to be able to have, uh, you know, the, the same sort of tooling that you expect on the local machine uh, that is available from a remote machine as well. You don't actually have to compromise here, which is a, a really nice thing. Um, I would say um, also give it a go. Try it. You know, you can try it with, um, you know, try Gitpod with your... Um, uh, your own projects there, which are being hosted on GitHub or Get, GitLab. You can try Space with some of the free de dev environments that they've got available to you. And of course, you can try it with um, an SSH machine, you know, just, just SSH into a, a, a Linux server you've got somewhere or a remote machine so you can get a feel for what's, what's going on there. And it's nice. Um, I think then um, let's just, so we just pop up the links for more information. Um, there we go. So we've got a slide here with some uh, useful links, uh, which you can go to. I'll leave, leave that up so we can snapshot it there. Um, we've also got some uh, questions, which I think we can just quickly uh, finish off there. We've got a questioning about licensing, which um, I didn't cover when I was talking about Gateway. Uh, and right now, the licensing, you do require a license for uh, IntelliJ IDEA or the other IDEs. Um, but it doesn't apply to the remote machine. It applies to the connection. So it's like your client is the thing which needs to be licensed effectively. If you are using IntelliJ IDEA, whether it's on an SSH server or in Gitpod or in, in space, 
if you yourself have a license for it, then all that license check happens and everything is fine. But it is still a, a licensed feature of the, the products. Um, and then one other question, which is a good one, is uh, downsides. Can somebody, um, would anyone like to dive in on what would be the downsides of this kind of approach? Good question. Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe go first with, with, yeah, with one that is uh, kind of obvious. Um, I think we're all used to having our development environments and setting up the tools that we want. And I think uh, one of the downsides is that it is a little bit of a new skill set to learn. The fact that you have these Docker files to script your environments, the fact that you may have to uh, configure your warm-up script on what should be happening beforehand so that the environment is also always new. So that is uh, definitely a little bit of a downside and a little bit of a bump um, to, to get used to. I also think as a developer, it's super interesting to do and be able to play with all that. Um, so that's also an upside of that. Yeah, yep, I mean, I, for me, it's entirely an upside, actually, uh, being able to automate and script the things I want to have. I mean, as a programmer, this is just, you know, so natural. I, I really, like, I have been working as a consultant before I founded startups and <laughs> built open source, pro or, like, in parallel to building open source projects. And I had, you know, several of these experiences where I would just hang out. I know, you know, what I cost on a per day basis, and I, I wouldn't be productive for a whole week because it was just so hard to set up getting into this. And just, you know, if they had scripted it, you know, I could just actually read it and see how, you know, what's really me. Like this readmes, they were always outdated. They never worked. And I had to pull in developers. And, you know, this was not only my time that I consume but also the, those of you know, the others um i'm so happy mm -hmm. this is gone for me at least uh i hope it is soon gone for many more people yeah absolutely i mean um for, from my point of view the downsides i think really is that it doesn't work with all application types you know there are still some applications mm -hmm. which uh i can't take advantage of this with you know there, there are times when as martin yeah. said i would like to be able to uh, rebuild the IDE without having to do it all on my laptop. I'd like to use a, well, I'd like to have a beefy machine do it all for me, which would be uh, very nice. Um, at which point then I think we should uh, wrap it up. Thank you very much, Sven, for joining us. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank you, Martin, as well. And apologies to the uh, for the, the, the sound issues that we had there. Um, we've, as I say, we've got some links here, which you can go off and, and find a bit more information there on remote development, on the YouTube channel, on Gitpod itself, of course, you know, Gitpod.io, uh, Gitpod. Uh, as the Twitter handle there, they've also got uh, lots of useful stuff on their YouTube and the Discord. Um, and then I think the last thing to do is just show you a final there, uh, slide there to say thank you all for joining. And please, as ever, like and subscribe. Um, thank you all for joining, and um, we'll see you at the next one. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Martin. Thanks, everyone.